it's recording. It's always those like last two minutes that just go crawling by every single time. All right, it's 5.59. It'll be six by the time you start. <laughs> so welcome everybody that has shown up so far. My name is Morgan Stutler. I'm just a volunteer here at the museum. And thank you for joining the most recent installment of the Museum Mixology Lecture Series. This is a virtual lecture series that's offered on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Uh, the purpose of this web, web series is to provide a variety of unique unique educational experiences, including cocktails and crime, sipping with science, and a toast to history. So I hope you've had the chance to stop by Madison Social, who is our partner for this program. If you did, thank you. If not, um, that's okay. We have a virtual tip, tip jar that I'm going to post in the chat. Um, a portion of MADSO's proceeds goes back to the museum, which is absolutely awesome. So, of course, we really, really appreciate your generosity and loyalty. Because of you, we are able to do programs like this. So tonight we have Dr. Josh Goodman from the State Archives of Florida. Say hi, Josh. Hello, hello. <laughs> Josh holds a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in history from FSU, Florida State University, and a PhD in history from Tulane University in New Orleans. He is a archives historian and Josh helps manage the process of digitizing archival records for the Florida Memory website and promotes the study of Florida history through pro programs like community outreach and educational programs. So Josh, that was a brief introduction, but I'm going to pass it over to you to tell us a little bit about your work and your new exhibit on the Florida Memory website and tonight's topic. All right, that sounds great. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you everybody for being here with us this evening uh, for another episode of A Toast to History. Uh, this is gonna be, uh, I, I think, uh, an informative one. Uh, I know that we're all uh, in the process of celebrating 100 years uh, since the 19th Amendment came around, uh, but I think that every state kind of has its own special little story about how this amendment actually played out, the road to it, and the implementation of it uh, in each state, uh, I think has its own very special unique story and Florida is no exception. Um, I notice looking through the list here that there's some names I recognize and then there's some names I don't recognize. So I thought that I would uh, take just a moment to make a very shameless plug uh, for the State Archives of Florida, which is a very rich resource for those of you who are teachers or genealogists or just have a curious uh, uh, just an interest in local history or in the history of our state and region. Um, we are located, the State Archives of Florida is, uh, is an agency within the Florida Department of State that's located in the R.A. Gray Building, two blocks behind the Capitol at 500 South Bruno Street. Um, there's a common misconception about archives that it's kind of like that movie National Treasure with Nicolas Cage, which is a great movie, by the way. But, but archives are not usually quite so secretive as some of the ones that he, uh, that he sort of goes to in, those, uh, in that movie. Uh, the State Archives is a public agency that is funded by taxpayers and therefore open and accessible uh, by, uh, to the public. And we, we actually have a full staff. It's almost like walking into a public library. The only issue is that instead of books, you uh, have 50,000 cubic feet essentially of records uh, from all kinds of government agencies as well as private individuals 
businesses and organizations to look through. It is, if you will, the raw materials of history. This is the guts that make up the books. Um, and so uh, all of that is accessible with very few exceptions to the public. Uh, now, of course, right now we happen to be closed because of the current national health emergency. However, we still have a full service reference desk staff uh, that is uh, that's taking requests and making copies of records. And if you don't know exactly what it is that you need to see, uh, just sending them a question, letting them know what you're working on and just asking if there are any records that are pertinent to subject X. Uh, they'll, they'll pass that question around to the staff. Some of them come to me, some of them come to other folks in the building and we will come up with some kind of an answer for you. And if there are relevant records uh, that, that deal with what you're interested in, we'll be glad to pass copies of those along to you. Um, we also do programs like the one that you're seeing here. Uh, we do these for teachers working with projects with their students, learning about primary source analysis and that sort of thing, as well as uh, different groups. I was just on the horn earlier today with uh, the Tallahassee Senior Center talking about the history of yellow fever and public health in Florida. So, you know, we've got everything from yellow fever to women's suffrage to the history of individual communities, we're, we're all over the map. Uh, anything we've got in the building, we'd love to get it out there for you to use because there's really no point otherwise in, in us having it. It's, it's, you know, the old light, what they say about light and bushel baskets and that sort of thing. So if there's anything that we can do ever to, uh, to help you with uh, historical research dealing with Florida or a community within Florida, uh, please do get in touch. And I'll have some contact numbers at the end of the program for you to use. Oh, and there's a nice picture of our public research facility. Obviously, in the age of COVID, it wouldn't be quite this crowded. We do have our tables spaced out a little better now. Uh, and so that when we are allowed to reopen, it'll be a very safe environment. We've even bought new keyboards and mice that can be washed and disinfected uh, so that we can be sure that we're providing you with the safest possible experience. But that is not why we're here this evening. I presume that everybody's here to give a good toast to history on the subject of women's suffrage. And we do have a new, uh, a new uh, exhibit online right now called In Her Own Words, and it's a, a history of prominent women in Florida. You can reach that by going directly to the Florida Memory website, floridamemory.com. Uh, but what I thought we'd do today to sort of plug that and kind of give you a primer on some of the women who are in that exhibit is talk a little bit about the history of the women's suffrage movement as it took place here in Florida. You're probably familiar with some of the big names already that are, that are associated with the women's suffrage movement. The Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Karen Chapman Catt, Alice Pauls of the world. Um, but, but the question remains, who, how did the women's suffrage movement play out right here in Florida and who were the big names associated with the movement. You also might be surprised to know that while the 19th Amendment did guarantee women the right to vote uh, in, in elections, women were voting in some elections prior to 1920. In fact, uh, women were allowed to vote in, uh, in some elections in Florida as early as 1915, but it depended on where you lived. There was no statewide suffrage amendment uh, during that time. And so uh, all of this kind of, it, the story of women's suffrage in Florida is not just a wham, bam, 1920, all of a sudden the floodgates open and every woman in the state can vote all at one time. Uh, the, the road to that moment was uneven. And so what we'll do tonight is sort of uh, take a, a, just a brief look at some of the key people who made uh, who, who represented milestones along that road. We'll also read from some of the, uh, at times, uh, heated debates uh, and about, uh, about women's suffrage and how that played out. There's some, there's some snark in here, so get, your, uh, uh, get ready. There's some, good, there's some good quotes in here. So that's our mission tonight. Let's, uh, I wanna start off, first of all, with a timeline. Uh, this is a timeline on the right-hand side, you have the women's suffrage movement, uh, the women's suffrage movement, and this is actually missing a few dates. I'd like to put a couple more on here, but this is gonna give you at least a sense 
of just how early the women's suffrage movement in the United States was going on. And of course, it goes back even before 1848. We just had to fix some kind of a moment to start it off. And I think you can argue that the women's suffrage movement really takes on a national character uh, with the Seneca Falls Convention, 1848. But, but compare that with the way that things are going here in Florida. I'm gonna get my favorite little tool out here with the pen. Uh, we've got just a couple of key milestones here, and I will talk about a couple more besides the ones that are on the timeline here. And one of the first things you'll notice is that in Florida, the women's suffrage movement, we really don't have anything big happening before 1884. And when we do, it's not anything that particularly statewide in, in, um, in force. And you'll see that the earliest thing I have here is that in 1884, Ellen Call Long befriended uh, a, a prominent women's rights activist, uh, Julia Ward Ho, at the World Exposition in New Orleans, or the Cotton Exposition, sometimes it's called. And the reason I have that on there, it's not necessarily that anything great came out of that exact moment, but it started a friendship uh, that, that started in turn a correspondence between Julia Ward Ho and, and Ellen Call Long and her social circle here in Tallahassee and really throughout the state. She was a socialite who was well known in, in places all over the state because of the work that she did, which we'll talk about soon. And, and that kind of contact was very important for bringing the women's suffrage movement into the South, into Florida, into places where it perhaps would not have sprung up quite so you know, spontaneously. Um, that becomes a, a huge issue is, is communication and transportation making these ideas move faster in the late 1800s. So Florida is a little bit of a latecomer uh, to the women's suffrage movement as we can see here. And that's a trend that, that goes throughout the South to a certain extent, at least when you get outside of the major metropolitan areas. And if you think about the timeline of what's going on in these other moments. If you look at what's going on during this time period when on a national, national basis, uh, the women's suffrage movement is actually getting some traction in other parts of the, of the country, think about what's going on in here, especially what's going on right in here. You've got a cataclysmic conflict in, in, the, uh, in the part of the Civil War. And then after that, you've got the Reconstruction era uh, that really saps a lot of the creative energy of the South during that time period. You've got, uh, you know, uh, the South essentially trying to rebuild its economy. And of course, they're trying to do it on the backs of, of so many of their traditional agricultural products with cotton and tobacco and things like that. And with the price of cotton not really cooperating with that effort, there's kind of this ongoing period where the South is trying so hard just to sort of survive and to, to try and build up its economy after the Civil War that there's not really a whole lot of air left in the room, you might say, uh, to, to, to go into trying to bring about much change in terms of political philosophy and thinking about sort of these, what would have been seen at that time as kind of a radical move, bringing women more into the political sphere at that time. So you just don't see a lot of movement at all in, in much of the South. Not to say that there's none at all, but, but at least here in Florida, we just don't see that much mention of the suffrage movement in the newspapers, nothing local. You'll see references to uh, these suffrage uh, societies and anti-suffrage societies being formed and some snarky editorial commentary and that sort of thing in, in the papers, but that's really about it. So what moves the needle? If, not, if, if it's not going to just take place spontaneously, what moves the needle to get Southern states like Florida more into, uh, into the, set, uh, the, the women's suffrage movement? Um, two main forces that, that I can positively identify that really, that really help with this is the increase, uh, the, the, the greater prevalence of, of efficient modes of transportation, like the railroad, um, and the increase of, of better communication through the telegraph, and then later on down the line, the telephone, and the fact, it, it's not just those two things alone, because it's not like people are telegraphing each other about, oh, have you seen the latest women's suffrage movement thing from up in New York? That's not what I mean. But because of the telegraph and then the telephone, newspapers 
in major metropolitan areas, even in the South, are able to start publishing news that has happened more recently. They're able to fill up their pages with more and more stuff of interest to more and more people. It becomes cheaper and easier for them to produce richer and richer newspapers. If you don't believe me, take a look on the Chronicling America um, service through the Library of Congress and look at a newspaper in Florida from the 1830s or 40s and then take a look at a newspaper from the 1880s or 90s. The content changes incredibly. Not only is there more of it from other parts of the world, but there's actually a much greater variety. They're not filling as many columns with just talking about whatever the legislature was doing or whatever Congress was doing or something like that. They're actually including lots of different geographical areas in the newspaper because they're able to you know, they're able to actually get this material in. Also, the growth of newswire services is, is also helping with this as well. These associations of press agents uh, that are sending uh, news all around the country in sort of a syndicated format. And that makes it possible uh, for more ideas to be shared. And so as you have these increases in, in communication, it's also getting people interested in traveling to other places. You know, once there gets to be a little bit more of an economy in the South, people are starting to travel to the North more often. People become exposed to these ideas uh, that are being shared all around in the Northern cities uh, where the women's suffrage movement had a little bit more of a foothold and in the Midwest as well, uh, the, prog the more progressive areas in the Midwest. There's also another thing that becomes popular in the later 19th century that plays a role in this. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the Chautauqua movement or the Lyceum movement. And what these are, the Chautauqua movement, the Lyceum movement, remember that this is an era with no radio. You've got no television. Um, you know, if you're going to hear music, it has to be produced live. You've got to have musicians sitting in front of you performing this. Um, and so that, you know, that's, that's either somebody singing in their parlor, you know, during some kind of evening entertainment at a party, or it's going to be an operatic performance in a larger town. We even had an opera here in Tallahassee at one point, um, you know, or, or um, what developed in the, the latter part of the, of the 1800s is there they would have these traveling tent shows, so to speak, these traveling tent shows. And they get the name Chautauqua because there was a permanent one of these that existed in Chautauqua, New York. But pretty quickly, people realized that these tent shows that sort of featured all these wonderful musical entertainments and people sharing the latest scientific discoveries and lantern slides showing uh, what they called travelogues, these these uh, descriptions of faraway lands and the foods that people were eating in other countries and the, their political traditions and, and the music that they had, just all these different things. Uh, what Chautauquas and Lyceum, Lyceum events as well did is they would take snippets of all these different pieces of pop culture and uh, from all around the world, as well as, uh, you know, educational topics as well. And they would create these week long sessions where uh, a Chautauqua would come to your town and set up shop on the outskirts of town and you would come in and you'd buy tickets and you would actually listen to a series of lecturers and, and musicians and they'd have programs for the kids and, and it was a whole thing. There's lots of good books on this. We actually had a, a semi-permanent Chautauqua program over in Defuniac Springs right there on the lake. In fact, the Chautauqua building, I believe is still standing. Don't quote me on that, but I think it is. Um, that uh, we had a Chautauqua Association here in Florida that was very prominent in and one of the ideas that came up sometimes in these Chautauqua performances uh, was the idea of women's suffrage. They would they would debate things like bimetallism and currency or whether, whether women should have the right to vote or you know what is uh, you know should women serve in public office. I mean that just all kinds of things uh, that they would do in here, populism and, you know, the, the, the political philosophy of, of, uh, of populism and some of the things that went with that. All these came up in Lyceum and, and Chautauqua performances. So uh, between travel and communication, as you get into the later years of the 1800s, women's suffrage became one of the many elephants in the room that people, uh, especially people who had a little bit of education to them, started talking about a lot more often. And so all that was necessary 
once the communication and transportation was in the right place. All that was necessary was to have some individuals who had the time and the gumption uh, to actually take some action and try to move the needle a little bit on the question of women's suffrage. So let's take a look at a couple of people who were involved with that. Ellen Call Long, who lived right here in Tallahassee for the majority of her life, with the exception of a, of a stand or two in Pennsylvania when she was learning uh, silk culture. Ellen Call Long is one of the first people who we know of in Florida who was really serious about studying the issue of women's suffrage. How much she actually served as an activist in Florida in behalf of women's suffrage is not really all that clear, but we know for sure that she was at least in conversation with leaders of the women's suffrage movement because we know that she was good buddies with Julia Ward Ho, who was uh, one of the, one of the uh, leaders of the women's suffrage movement in the North. And she and Julia Ward Ho became friends uh, in New Orleans at the 1884 exposition there. Julia Ward Ho was put in charge of the women's department of the exhibition, and she had delegates from every state that was participating, that, that women delegates who actually came over and participated in that women's department at the exposition. And um, they did all kinds of different things, uh, you know, showing off various crafts and, and uh, cooking techniques and uh, industrial things like, for example, uh, Ellen Call Long, uh, because again, talking about the South trying to rebuild its economy after the war, Ellen Call Long, who uh, was, uh, her family, of course, had the, the Grove in Tallahassee. Her father was uh, Richard Keith Call, one of our territorial governors and also a, a territorial delegate to the U.S. House of Representatives before we were a state. Uh, the Grove was his, uh, was his plantation. He also had Orchard Pond up on Lake Jackson. And after uh, Governor Call passed away in the 1860s, it fell to Ellen Call Long to run the Grove. And in the wake of the Civil War, her finances were not exactly the best. And so one of the things, one of the several things that she did, she became an author uh, and, and sold a lot of books, Florida Breezes being her most famous one, of course. Um, but a lot of folks don't know that she actually developed her own uh, silk culture industry right there at the Grove. Uh, if you visit there, they'll, they'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, John Grandage and the, the folks there at the Grove Museum, I definitely recommend a, a visit. Uh, it's, it's not just the house. The house is beautiful, but they, they take you all around the grounds and there's a lot that they can tell you about how the Grove became this sort of bastion of women's industry. Uh, in, at the end of the Civil War because Ellen Call Long used that silkworm culture uh, industry as, as a way to not only enhance her own income or at least attempt to do so, but also to advocate for women all across the South to find industries of their own to take up um, and, and to help her state as well. She thought that silkworm culture, if it could be uh, started in Florida, that it might help provide not a substitute for cotton, but uh, an adjunct at least. And so when she uh, came into contact with Julia Ward Ho while she was showing off some of the products of her work at the New Orleans Exposition in 1884, the two of them became very close friends because they had such similar convictions about uh, the, the potential independence of women, uh, the fact that women could and should apply their own industry and their own talents uh, to improve not only the economy of their household, but also of their community and their states. And so I just want to share with you a little bit of how Julia Ward Ho actually treated this relationship, because uh, Julia Ward Ho, part of, her, part of her value to the women's suffrage movement is that she was a very good organizer. That's why they put her in charge of the women's department at the New Orleans Exposition of 1884, because they knew that she knew how to network and to get things done. So here's a letter uh, uh, from Julia Ward Ho that was written to Ellen Call Long in 1885. I just want to read a couple of little snippets out of it for you. Uh, and she has, I want to show you why I'm only going to read a couple of snippets. Julia Ward Ho, love her, but her handwriting was absolutely atrocious, probably because she wrote so many. Uh, so many uh, letters to so many different people. And uh, yeah, after a while, I'm sure your hand gets tired. She even mentions that a time or two in her, uh, uh, in her messages, but here we go. So she says, your friendly goodwill has a prominent place among the returns of the venture. And I hope to profit by it in more ways than one, talking about Ellen Call Long's assistance at the 1884 exposition. 
Therefore, are you not bound to help me in my efforts to forward and organize the industries of women? And she mentions later on down the letter, did I write you of a Mrs. O. Jen of Jacksonville, Florida, who wrote me asking, uh, to, asking me to interest myself in getting a women's exchange started in that place? A women's exchange being an organization that was helping women sort of uh, uh, take advantage of, of um, it, to become better business women or to start industries of their own. I wrote to Mrs. Alex, Alexander Whitehall, who, as you know, has a winter residence near that place, and Mrs. W responded very amiably. Can't you do something to help such an enterprise? And this is not the only letter that we have between Ellen Call Long and Julia Ward Ho. They actually kept up quite a correspondence. And, and Mrs. Ho always seems to be asking Ellen Call Long what kinds of, of work she might be able to do to help uh, the women's, not just the women's suffrage movement, but the movement to, to help women become more industrious in the state of Florida on their own behalf. Um, and while we don't have Ellen's responses back to Julia Ward Host, we don't know exactly what she said back to her, we know that this at least got the wheels turning in Ellen's mind. Because in the Call Brevard papers at the State Archives of Florida, we can see that occasionally Ellen Call Long would chop out a newspaper article in the newspaper that was talking about women's suffrage, and sometimes she would make notes about how either either that, that what was in the article itself or a rebuttal to the article if it was an anti-suffrage article. So we know that she was kicking this idea around in her mind. We know that she was probably talking about it with the women that she tried to organize things with in the state of Florida. However, it's, it's not clear how much of this she spoke of publicly. Um, and at, at this time in Florida, as you can imagine, it wouldn't have been a terribly popular subject, um, you know, to, to try and rock the boat that much. Uh, it would have been seen as, as, as sort of radical down here, especially once the more conservative element of the Democratic Party took over in 1877 uh, at the end of Reconstruction. So it's, it's not clear that she was doing a whole lot publicly, but at the very least, she got the seeds planted and got the conversation started in Florida about women's suffrage and how it could sort of be a cog a, 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 an adjunct to women becoming more industrious in their own communities. So the next person actually after, after uh, Ellen Call Long, who kind of comes to mind as a leader in the women's suffrage movement is actually not Florence Murphy Cooley. She's the next person after, after this. I couldn't find a picture of Ella Chamberlain. So, so I'm sticking, uh, I, I'll, I'll have to just sort of tell you about her while we take a look at Florence Murphy Cooley. But uh, Ella Chamberlain uh, was a woman who grew up in Iowa. She moved to Tampa around 1881 and, uh, and, and was, was relatively educated. She was married uh, and, and she, was she was an educated woman. She attended a women's rights convention in 1892 in Des Moines. And when she got back, she felt a little bit fired up. Remember I mentioned that travel was one of the factors involved in kind of getting the women's suffrage movement started in the Southern states where it had not previously taken hold very much. Travel does wonders. It's great for students. It's great. I was just talking with uh, with the staff at the Tallahassee Museum before we got started about a program at the National World War II Museum where we would take teachers over to Pearl Harbor or to Normandy every year. And the reason for that is that you are inspired by travel in a way that you cannot get inspired any other way. No video will do, no readings will do, no class will do. Travel can do magical works. And that I think is a big part of how Ella Chamberlain got so fired up to do what she did in the early 1890s. So she gets back from this women's rights convention in Des Moines in 1892. And she says, you know what? I want to write about this topic. I want to I want to see if I can put something in the local newspaper. And so she approached the editor of the newspaper there in Tampa. I think it's the Tampa Tribune, but I wouldn't swear to it. Anyway, so she approaches this newspaper editor and she asks if she could write a column. And they come back and say, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we'd, you know, we'd love for you to put a column into the paper, maybe weekly or every other week or something about issues of interest to women and children issues of interest to women and children. Now, what does that sound like in the 1890s? And Ella Chamberlain later said when she was speaking to a national group after, after she had gotten to be a more prominent uh, person in the movement, she said, and I quote, 
the world was not suffering for another cake recipe, and the children seemed to be getting along better than the women. So as far as, as issues of interest to women and children, Ella Chamberlain was not really having it. So she actually endeavored to write articles about women's suffrage. And surprisingly for the 1890s, the editors of this newspaper in, Ta in, in Tampa let her do it. That would have, I, she would have been one of the few voices that you would have come across in your daily newspaper uh, who was a local Floridian actually talking about women's suffrage. But it goes farther than that. That's just the beginning of Ella Chamberlain's story. Uh, she was asked to give uh, what's called a recitation at a social gathering that she was at. Remember, this is a time with no radio, no television, nothing like that. So what do you do when you're an intelligent person and you get invited to a party? You sit around and you discuss the news. Somebody plays on the piano, somebody sings, somebody recites a poem. It's kind of like a salon, you know, that sort of thing. So Ella Chamberlain's in one of these gatherings in Tampa, and she, gives, uh, she was asked to give a speech of some sort a recitation. And she decided to take as her topic, taxation without representation. But it's not taxation without representation the way that we learn about it in American history. No, no, she did not, she wasn't talking about uh, the, uh, the colonists getting ready to, uh, you know, to make complaints over to the king uh, about, about all of that in the late British colonial period. No, she talked about taxation without representation as being the position of women in Florida at that time. She said that women were being the ones who were essentially taxed without representation. And so a male member of her circle actually suggested, and this is a male member of, of the group that she was with, suggested that she should start a suffrage organization. And so she did. The result of that meeting was the Florida Woman Suffrage Association. A lot of times the first, uh, the first women's suffrage association that is listed, I think there's a JSTOR article or two from the Florida Historical Quarterly that says that the first organization was in 1912. That's not so. Uh, it was actually the, uh, the, the organization, the first one that, that we know of at least, uh, was actually formed more than, gosh, that's, that's more than a decade before that, um, almost two decades in 1893 uh, with the formation of the Florida Women's Suffrage Association. And uh, Ella Chamberlain was the first president. She associated it with the National, Associa uh, National uh, American Women's Suffrage Association, NASA, which is Susan B. Anthony's organization. Uh, and so she attended annual meetings of the, uh, of the national organization there um, and then reported on her work in Florida and then brought ideas from the national organization back to Tampa to try and make it work uh, in her organization there. Now, before we, before we go to, to um, calling Ella Chamberlain uh, just a, a complete platinum uh, angel of a hero, you should remember that the, suffra the early uh, suffragists in the South, they understood the problem of women's suffrage within the broader political atmosphere of the South at that time. So the question of suffrage was not just a question of men versus women and, and the, you know, whether or not to include women. There's also a, a, a very real question at this time about whether it had been a good idea or not to guarantee African Americans and other minorities the right to vote as well. And there's a conscious movement at this time to disenfranchise African Americans who otherwise would have been enfranchised by those uh, constitutional amendments that, that, that come into play after the Civil War. And so one of the angles that Ella Chamberlain actually uses that sort of problematizes her contribution uh, to the movement is she says that it actually makes no sense uh, for white women to be represented in government by the votes of African-American men and men who had recently immigrated to the United States from other countries. This is actually a, a quote uh, from the Women's Journal. It's the edition of the January 26, uh, 1895 edition of the Women's Journal. She said, I'm a freeborn American woman. I deny that my brother American can properly represent me. How can I, with the blood of heroes in my heart and with the free and independent spirit they bequeathed me, quietly submit to representation by the alien and the Negro. 
remembering, of course, that that's the parlance that was used at that time. So again, that's not to say that uh, it's not necessarily to say that uh, that 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 we shouldn't remember Ella Chamberlain as a very important contributor to this movement. But when you read through these words, you have to remember that the question of suffrage is a very multifaceted issue. And we're gonna see this pop up again before the presentation's over, especially when it comes time for Congress to pass that 19th Amendment. Ironically enough, this is a spoiler alert here, one of the greatest, one of the greatest foils uh, to the women's suffrage movement is actually going to come from Florida, and he's going to say some powerful stuff, uh, what we might even call a dog whistle these days, that's going to mix together the issues of women's suffrage and African-American suffrage as well. But I digress. So um, the organization uh, that, that Ella Chamberlain starts, uh, as of 1895, its membership was at about 100 people, so not much of a splash there. Uh, there were a few chapters formed in other towns, uh, but not a whole lot going on there. And, and there wasn't really a clear heir apparent uh, to, to Ella Chamberlain. And so when she left the state in 1897, the Florida Woman Suffrage Association that she had formed and uh, sort of uh, cultivated and nurtured for a couple of years there, uh, finally folded. And it would be several more years uh, before there would be a large statewide organization that was involved uh, with the women's suffrage movement again in the state. That's what brings us to Florence Murphy Cooley. So Florence Murphy Cooley lived in Jacksonville. So we kind of moved the center of women's suffrage now over to Jacksonville. She was involved in a lot of organizations that were very typical for women who were intelligent and very outspoken at that time. Uh, she was at one time president of the Florida Division of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, uh, which at that time, as you can imagine, with the conservative, you know, with just the political milieu of the time and, and with so many people have in Florida having experienced, you know, their parents having been in the war, cousins, and, and uh, in some cases, you've got uh, veterans themselves and their wives who are still living talking about this. Uh, that was a very prominent organization that was at the center of a lot of charitable causes at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the early 20th century. She was also very active. Florence was in the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs, uh, which was just coming into its own at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and she also, uh, to give you an idea of, of how much, she wasn't just a club woman, she went out and did things on her own. She also chaired a committee uh, that, that was able to erect a monument uh, to the memory of Jean Rabot, who was one of those French leaders that had attempted uh, to form a French colony in Northeast Florida uh, back in the, early, uh, in the early days of the Spanish colonial period. So pretty, uh, pretty, pretty uh, big lady about town, so to speak. She established the Florida Equal Franchise League in 1912 in Jacksonville, had been involved prior to that in trying to, uh, in to get women's suffrage onto the agenda in the legislature and get women interested in that. But 1912 is when she actually gets around uh, to forming this organization. Uh, in Jacksonville, they opened an office. They printed up literature, flyers, posters, and distributed those around the state. And much as Ella Chamberlain had done, uh, they also uh, associated with Susan B. Anthony's National, Associ uh, National American Women's Suffrage Association. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, Florence Murphy Cooley was not, uh, was not content with just reaching out uh, to other women in the state who might be interested in this issue. She took the fight directly to the legislature. Uh, she actually openly challenged, and let's see if I can find it here. She actually openly challenged um, the, uh, the state senators uh, who were in charge of, of the committee that was taking up uh, a bill on the issue of women's suffrage. She actually open, openly challenged those guys to a debate and they convinced Frances Perkins who would later become the first woman elected to the United States House of Representatives. Uh, she actually, they got Frances Perkins to come down and be their champion. I just wanna read you a, a snippet or two out of this letter because it is snarky and I love it. All right, here we go. Dear Senator, and this was sent to both Senator Y.L. Watson uh, and James N. Wilson, 
both of whom were leading the opposition to a resolution calling for the women's suffrage movement to be put to a referendum. So in other words, the question right now is whether the Senate would convince, uh, would consent to the women's suffrage question being put to a referendum so that everybody could vote on it all across the state. And that was being opposed at this time. Dear Senator, this is May 8th, 1913. Dear Senator, in order that the cause of equal suffrage may have a vote of the Senate, we respectfully challenge you to engage in a joint debate on the subject and name as our champion, Miss Jeanette Rankin, who has kindly visited Florida at our request in order to further our cause. And they said, go on to say, you know, they, they talked about the structure that they thought the debate should take. They said, you have the privilege of opposing equal suffrage if you choose, but we do not believe you have a privilege of refusing the people of Florida all the people of Florida a right to express their views at the polls. In other words, if this is, you know, this is something that a referendum really should take place, it's that important. In the debate, we would like to have this explained. We do not think for a moment that you or any other gentleman of the Senate will wish to avoid an open discussion of so absorbing a topic, one which means so much to mankind as well as womankind, and we take it for granted that you will accept this challenge or appoint some other able debater in your place. Gauntlet thrown down. Now, many of you, uh, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't take much imagination for you to, to, to think that uh, there's a good likelihood that the senators would come up with some very snarky response and talk about how much they really appreciate the women of Florida and they would not dare thinking of taking any step that would uh, you know take her off of the pedestal onto which that she had placed herself uh, with her piety and charity and all so and so and so. Well the senators in this particular case did not respond at all uh, and so they did that debate did not happen uh, but, uh, but that was definitely a shot across the bow by Florence Murphy Cooley and company. The now that particular organization, it was mostly centered around Jacksonville. A little bit later, uh, the next year, uh, Dr. Mary Safford, who was from Orlando, was actually involved in creating a larger statewide organization that, that the Jacksonville League that, uh, that Florence Murphy Cooley created became subsumed into. And Dr. Mary Sanford's organization was called the Florida Equal Suffrage Association. It was established in Orlando, 1913. They ended up, uh, by the time that, you, within a couple of years, with 28 local leagues in 13 counties, mostly in urban areas, as you can imagine. Get this, five of those local leagues were established by men. Interesting. There was limited appeal here, uh, even though there was a greater geographic breadth with uh, Safford's organization, the membership was a little higher than what Ella Chamberlain was able to command with her group out of Tampa, but it never reached above 1,000 members. Uh, so a few more drops in the bucket, but, but not that much more. There's one other person who oftentimes comes up in discussions of the women's suffrage movement. And it's interesting because she actually occupied a very difficult position. Uh, May Man Jennings, who was the wife of William Sherman Jennings, who was governor of Florida, I think from 1901 to 1905. I should have put that in my notes. Um, anyway, so she was first lady of Florida and she, was, she also served a term as president of the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs. And even when she wasn't president, she was always chairing some committee or another. She was very prominent in that organization. And you would think, that as president of the Florida Federation uh, and being such a staunch advocate of women's suffrage, that she would have, uh, that she would have been a really big megaphone uh, for the issue of women's suffrage. And she was in many ways as an individual, but she had to walk a very careful tightrope as the president of the women's, uh, of the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs, because not all women in Florida were uniformly interested in suffrage. And also the women's club is always, and this has been true for as long as they've been around, they're very careful about which political subjects they get involved with. That's been the case ever since that they ever since they've been an organization. And at that time, there was a lot of push and pull on both sides of this issue 
uh, asking you know, for the women's, uh, the Florida Federation not to get too deeply involved in the question. And so May Man Jennings did do a lot to further the women's suffrage uh, uh, movement through speeches and, and through um, you know, advocating for different causes and, and helping to bring, using her name to sort of uh, bring some, uh, some extra prestige to the cause. But while she was president, she actually didn't say that much uh, because she had to walk a very fine line. And, and it's actually true that during the time that she was there, some, uh, some women's clubs actually left the Federation because they didn't want uh, to, to get involved with any particular, uh, with any particular political cause uh, along these lines. And so it's, it, May Man Jennings actually occupied a very difficult position during her time, a very important advocate for women's suffrage, but not always able to speak her mind 100% because she understood the value of the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs and what it was doing, not just in the cause of, of improving conditions for women, but improving communities, uh, looking to what we might call the, the sort of the early germ of the environmentalist movement here in Florida and things like that. Uh, so she had a lot on her plate. Women's suffrage was just one piece of it. Now, there is a common misconception that women just did not vote at all prior to the passage of the 19th Amendment. And that is simply not true. As of 1912, women could vote even in national elections in several states, including Idaho, Colorado, Wyoming, California, Kansas, Arizona, and Utah, because constitutionally, regulating suffrage is a power that's reserved for the states. And in many states, um, even, even local suffrage was, was, you know, you could leave that up to an individual county or to an individual municipality. The right to the vote was, was considered very sacred and something that the states certainly cherished having control over that. And so a lot of states did use their authority to allow women to vote prior to 1920, but it was not a majority by far. Um, and furthermore, even here in the state of Florida, now we did not have a statewide suffrage amendment like Idaho and Wyoming and California and some of the ones like that. However, we did have some cases where um, uh, in, uh, women were able to actually vote. By the way, I just want to check the little green line that you normally goes around my screen right now. Are you guys able to actually see this picture of May Man Jennings? Somebody type in the chat and let me know. I just wanna make sure that you guys are actually able to see the screen. Okay, good. It just doesn't have the little green box around it like it usually does. I just wanna make sure I'm not sitting here talking about slides you can't see. Okay, good. All right, uh, so anyway, there is, uh, there is uh, Florida actually got in on the, the women's suffrage game uh, a little earlier than 1920 because we actually had uh, women who could vote in municipal elections. And it all started with a tiny little town that many of you have probably never heard of called Fellsmere. It's, uh, I think it's in modern day Indian River County, I think is where it is now. Not positive on that, I think it's in Indian River County. Anyway, it's called Fellsmere. And it happened almost by accident. Well, the people who wanted it to happen, it wasn't an accident for them. It happened almost by accident for the legislature. So here's the skinny on how this happened. So when a town wanted to get incorporated, if you wanna incorporate your town so that you can have a mayor and a city council and a city police force and the power to tax and all that stuff, in order to do that, you have to get a city charter you, or a town charter, uh, one or the other. And you have to get that approved by the legislature. That's been true for you know well over a hundred years now. Now, those are what was called by the legislature at that time courtesy bills, because the bill uh, asking that a charter, you know, establishing a charter for a town would be introduced by your local representative. And it was considered a courtesy bill because when somebody put one of these forward that's just an act to incorporate such and such a city or such and such a town or to amend such and such a thing, that was a fairly non-controversial issue. Town charters, that's, it's good for everybody, right? That means that Florida's growing, it's getting bigger. And so legislators tended to kind of do a, you scratch, you know, I'll scratch your back if you'll scratch mine type thing. And so they tended to just approve without even reading them, uh, these town charters. So Felsmere 
was a planned community. It was plan it was a planned farming community where they sold off this this big guy bought up this great big chunk of land, started draining it with canals, and then started selling off these lands to people so that they could establish farms. And and it got big enough that it was finally time to incorporate a town. And so they wrote out this town charter and they snuck in there a little provision in one of the sections that said uh, that the, you know, the electors had to be, they had to own property in the town in order to participate in the elections. But that's all they said. They didn't say you had to be a man. They just said you had to own property. That's all it was. And so they sent that bill through their representative up to Tallahassee to get approved in 1915. And lo and behold, it became law with that provision in there. And instantly, they let everybody know that all of a sudden, Florida had a municipality in which women were permitted to vote. And it's, you can tell from the newspaper commentary that happened afterward that most legislators had no idea that they had just opened, sort of opened the floodgates and created a precedent for women to have the right to vote in municipal elections. In fact, by 1919, more than a dozen Florida towns allowed their women to vote in municipal elections. There were several in Polk County, Orantia, uh, let's see, um, Orlando, women could vote. I think Miami was in that mix by that time. Uh, there's, there's quite a list of them that I normally have with me here. Um, and anyway, so we had more than a dozen towns that could vote. Absolutely incredible uh, change there. And, and because women could vote, uh, once these, and More Haven is one of them, and the reason I know more Haven is, is because uh, by the time you get to 1920, we've actually already got women serving in municipal offices because the electors were permitted, you know, the, the electors who were choosing city officials and town officials, now they could actually vote for women because women were uh, considered full citizens within the context of that municipality. In fact, the woman who is believed to be the first mayor of a town in the traditional South, south of the Mason-Dixon line, was a Floridian. Her name was Marion Newhall Horowitz, uh, Newhall Horowitz, and she was elected unanimously by the electors of Moore Haven uh, to be mayor uh, in, I think it's 1918, 1919, somewhere around there, uh, that she's elected mayor. Uh, but yeah, she was elected unanimously to the post of mayor of Moore Haven uh, when, it, when it incorporated. So some incredible stuff happening well before 1920. Now, still, despite this, as you can imagine, women's suffrage advocates were not content with just being able to vote on zoning and city taxation and who's going to be the next fire chief. That they were not content with. They wanted a state amendment guaranteeing women the right to vote in Florida. That was acceptable. But what they really wanted was a national amendment guaranteeing women the right to vote in all of the United States states at that time. So how does Florida participate in that, particular, uh, in that particular part of the process? An amendment for the state guaranteeing all women in the state of Florida the right to vote came up four different times in Florida prior to 1920. Local groups lobbied the legislature, passed out literature, challenged citizens, senators to debate, as we've seen, but no gas. In fact, there was actually quite a bit of active opposition to women's suffrage by Floridians in political authority. For example, in the 1910s, both of our United States senators, Duncan Fletcher uh, and Park Trammell, both of them opposed a federal suffrage amendment because they believed that this was a state's issue. Now, we're gonna get back to that connection between women's suffrage and the question of African-American suffrage because while they, they, they hide behind this issue of, well, this is the state's prerogative. This is a, a right that's guaranteed to the states. Once, once Congress takes, you know, once Congress passes a law saying, okay, once there's an amendment saying, well, Congress can actually control this aspect of, of state government, all of a sudden they're gonna to wanna to control everything. That's, that's the argument that was being placed against the national uh, suffrage amendment at this time. So when the 19th Amendment came up in Congress uh, to be voted on, Florida's four House members, we had four representatives in the House of Representatives at that time. I think we're up to 20 something now, 28, 25, 28, somewhere in there. And, uh, but at that time we had four and Florida's uh, 
U.S. House delegation split right down the middle, two and two. Uh, Herbert Drain and William Sears of South Florida and Central Florida voted in favor of the 19th Amendment, guaranteeing women the right to vote. John Smithwick and Frank Clark, representing the northern part of Florida, they voted against the amendment. In fact, Frank Clark was one of the main leaders. He was from Gainesville, by the way, so all you Seminole fans, now you've got some more ammunition. Uh, Frank Clark, he's from Gainesville, he was one of the main leaders of the opposition against the amendment in the United States House of Representatives. He said in a 1915 speech, and I quote, the word of God invades against women's suffrage, and the plans of the creator would be, in a measure, subverted by its adoption. God has decreed that man is to be head of the family, and woman is to be his helpmeet. Never run across that word before. Help me. And any attempt to change this order of human affairs is an attempt to change and to overthrow one of the solemn decrees of God Almighty. So that was uh, one of Florida. That was that was one of Florida's principal contributions to the 19th Amendment uh, debate in Congress over the 19th Amendment. There. There's also I've got another one here that I want to make sure and get to here in our last minute here. So this is when it looked like the 19th Amendment was going to actually pass in 1919. Remember, it, it, it finally was ratified in 1920, but it passed Congress in 1919. And then it took a few months for enough states to actually ratify the amendment for it to go into effect. So the, the big debate in Congress actually took place in May of 1919. Now, it was looking already like the House of Representatives had enough votes to make this go through. But old Frank Clark, put in one last final word about this, and this is when the dog whistles really start coming in. Listen to this. I feel very deeply about this matter. I feel for my country. I believe that this is the worst act that the American Congress will have ever performed so far as the future of this great country is concerned. And while I know this resolution is going through the House, again, they had the votes, it was already done. At this point, he's just blowing hot air. I have an abiding faith that three-fourths of the states will never ratify it. And then applause is indicated in the congressional record. Democrat, here, here's, here's an interesting part though. Democrats cannot support this resolution because of the fact that it contravenes every principle of democracy, and particularly is it antagonistic to the doctrine of states' rights, which has ever been one of the cardinal principles of the Democratic Party. This resolution takes the matter of the regulation of suffrage entirely out of the power of the respective states of the union and confers upon the federal government the unrestricted power to regulate elections and prescribe the qualifications of voters. The qualifications of voters. Hmm, wonder what he could have in mind with that. Farther on down, he says, this opens up anew the Negro question in all the Southern states, and I warn my colleagues from the South who are supporting this measure that they are, quote, playing with fire, which is likely to produce another reconstruction conflagration in our Southland. And so he's essentially evoking the idea that in order to enforce this amendment, if it were to pass, the federal government might, federal government might actually use force uh, to enforce this amendment, as in military force, as they did in Reconstruction. Horror of horrors. So that, uh, <laughs> uh, that, was, that was Florida's contribute, or one, one fourth at least of Florida's contribution in the House of Representatives when this was all going through. However, the amendment did uh, go through and it did pass the House and it did pass the Senate, which meant it was thrown out to the states. Now it just so happens that the uh, Florida legislature was actually in session at the time uh, that Congress was, uh, was finished debating this and they actually voted on the 19th Amendment. And so Florida was one of the few states that actually had the power at the moment the amendment went out to the states for ratification. Florida had the opportunity to be first to ratify it. And in fact, our governor at that time Oh, by the way, there's a picture of old Frank Clark, Representative Frank Clark. Okay, and uh, so let me see if I've got a picture here of, uh, oh no, I don't. I don't have a picture of, of our, of our uh, governor at the time, uh, Sidney Johnston Katz. 
Uh, he's the only guy who's ever been, uh, has ever been governor of Florida, at least in recent memory, who was not a Democrat or a Republican. He was a prohibitionist. He was from the prohibitionist party, our one prohibitionist governor. And anyway, he saw this as an opportunity for Florida to really put a feather in its cap. And I've got his message to the legislature here. Uh, the legislature was in session. They were about to go out of session because it was June uh, when all this was finally voted on. This is what Katz had to say. He said, the daily papers announced the fact that the Congress of the United States has passed woman's suffrage and now the matter goes to the different states for ratification. All right. The legislature of the state of Florida will adjourn tomorrow and it has an opportunity while now in regular and due order of putting itself on record to be the first state in the sisterhood of states to ratify this great movement upon the part of the federal government. Therefore, as governor of our great state, I earnestly recommend that you, by your vote, ratify this action upon the part of the federal Congress and add an imperishable laurel to your state, which can never die the fact of being the first state of the union to recognize woman as an equal with her brother man in the rights of suffrage. That's part of what got Sidney Johnston Katz elected is that he was actually a minister, a Protestant, a, 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 I think he's a Baptist minister prior to this. And so he could really turn a phrase. Uh, anyway, unfortunately, the legislature did not see it his way. And in fact, rather ironically, Florida was not the first uh, state to ratify. In fact, we did not ratify this amendment at all before it went into effect in 1920. In fact, we did not ratify the 19th Amendment until 1969. 1969. And the only reason we even did it then was that the Florida League of Women Voters actually got a hold of some, uh, some representatives in the legislature. Uh, Dick Pope was one of them. And they said, look, it's the 50th anniversary of this going through. We know that it doesn't actually mean anything. It's mostly just going to be a, a, a symbolic gesture, but can we please ratify this amendment as a goodwill gesture to the women voters of this state? And they did it. In 1969, Florida finally ratified the 19th Amendment. So once that happened, uh, women were able to serve in public office and in fact did so quite frequently. I actually have here on the ballot, I mean, just as soon uh, women's suffrage became a reality in, let's see, uh, the, the, the final ratification was finished, I believe, in September of 1920, which actually allowed women in Florida enough time not only to register to vote, but to uh, put themselves up for election in the general election of 1920. And so a number of women actually did that. And we have a number of county officers who actually became, uh, who were duly elected to, the, to their positions in 1920. One of which you're looking at here, Agnes Ballard, who became the, um, the uh, superintendent of public instruction, uh, which same thing as our superintendent of public schools like Rocky Hanna here in, in Leon County. In 1920, this is down in Palm Beach County. Uh, where she was. And then there's either a tax collector or a tax assessor over in Franklin County who was elected in 1920 as well. This is not to say that women had not served in public office before. Um, as I've got on this slide here, sometimes women would be appointed to serve out the remainder of their husband's terms if they died in office. So for example, we've got uh, a woman here uh, named Mary Jane Curry, uh, where her husband died at some point uh, in his, um, during his term, and she actually was elected to, or she was appointed rather to finish out his term as county treasurer uh, in there. So we do have cases of women serving in their own right. Women do serve as justices of the peace, as constables, as inspectors of marks and brands and things like that, as notaries public, uh, even as early as the 1890s. So it's not 100% true that women did not serve in public office prior to 1920, but it definitely picked up big time. Looking at the clock here, I see that we've come to the end of our time and I wanna make sure that we've got some time for questions. So I think we've reached a good stopping point and I'd love it if, some, uh, if, if you guys have any questions, uh, just put them into the textual chat there uh, and, and I will do my best to answer them. If I can't answer them, I'll try and recommend a good source uh, to help you get some answers. So anybody got any questions?
and I'm gonna get a drink of water too. <laughs> Well, must have been thorough. Haven't got any questions so far. All right, let's see. And let's see, there is something else I wanna put up here at the end. What about African-American uh, African women, could they vote? Technically, yes. In practice, eh. Women did attempt to register to vote in, in a number of places around the state of Florida, and there were reports uh, into the NAACP that they were either turned away or there were measures taken to make it very difficult for them to register. It was uh, people all across the South were already trying to make it difficult for African American men to register to vote, and, but, but it, it, with the, it was considered a particularly big threat. Uh, at this time that African-American women would suddenly have uh, the, um, the, the right to vote as well. There's a tremendous amount of newspaper chatter about this and, and people really contorting themselves into a thousand bins trying to explain why it was such a bad idea for African-American women to be able to vote. And in Jacksonville, the NAACP does actually report on cases in Jacksonville where women were turned away. Ocoee, of course, we know that there was a, an election day riot there. Uh, and, and we can, we, I don't know whether any women registered to vote there in Ocoee. Uh, but, but that's certainly a, a sort of a hotbed of, of um, opposition to African-American voting in general. But Jacksonville, for sure, I do have, there, there's reports into the NAACP about that. Any other questions? Uh, these, that's, that's an excellent question. Anything else? Let's see, who was the biggest, uh, the sort of the most prominent lady who was voted to office? Well, I'd argue that um, I'd, I'd argue that any of the women who were able to achieve some level of public office, uh, you know, in that first election, they're all real trailblazers. Certainly, Agnes Ballard. I mean, being uh, being elected to uh, being chosen by by her citizens by her fellow citizens to be in charge of the education of the next generation. I mean, for the whole county and Palm Beach County's booming at this time, right? They're starting to build hotels right and left once that Flagler Railroad goes in. Uh, I mean, that's a big deal. The, you could argue that sort of the first woman to really take the next step and represent her fellow citizens at the state level rather than, um, rather than at the county level is a woman from Orlando whose name escapes me right off the bat. I thought I had a slide with her on here. Let's see, first woman rep, Orlando, Florida. Edna Giles Fuller, that's her name, Edna Giles Fuller. This is my, my little, my little um, Google search isn't turning her up, but her name's Ed, Edna Giles Fuller. Do we know the percentage of eligible women who actually voted in that first 1920 election? I'm not sure uh, if we have those statistics available. Where I would recommend you look for that is, uh, is, is look in the annual reports, it may actually be biannual reports at that time, of the Florida Secretary of State. Those are actually available online. Uh, you can get them in, in online format and searchable PDFs uh, through the State Library of Florida. The library catalog is at library.florida.gov. Just search for Report Secretary of State Florida, and that should bring it up for you. Look at the 1920, 1921, uh, biannual report from the Secretary of State, and there should be some voting data in there. And I would not be surprised uh, if it, they may not have, that annual report may have been at such a time that they didn't have the data necessary to, to put that information in, splitting it male, female, but I bet you they tried it 1921, 1922. Um, if, you, uh, if you pass along an email to me, and I'm gonna put my email address here in the chat, uh, and, and ask that question to me in an email, that'll give me some time to maybe look at some other sources that I could recommend to you for that. Uh, I'm gonna put that into the chat right now. And uh, all of you, I've, I've put some information here on the screen 
about um, about uh, the you know some quick numbers and some email addresses and some catalogs to help you uh, make take greater advantage of the state archives collection. But you're also welcome to email me directly if you have a, a research question like this. Now let's see, we have somebody else up here. Okay. Uh, Okay, from Jennifer Sullivan. Uh, what were the age minimums for women in addition to the landowning requirements? Talking about back when, uh, back when there was a, um, um, back when there was, when it was just municipal governments allowing women to vote. I don't know what the age requirement was. That would have varied from town to town back when it was municipal governments that were governing it because, because towns could actually set the requirements for suffrage within the context of their own municipal elections. So for example, uh, what More Haven was requiring might have been different than what was required you know, up in, in, up in um, Felsmere versus Arantia or something like that. So, so that's one, where, the way you would find that out is you would actually look at the charters for those towns. And I can actually get you the, the chapter numbers uh, for uh, the legislative acts actually establishing those towns and setting suffrage requirements. And we could look to see if the ages are listed in there. If it weren't for, if, if not that, if they don't set an age, then they're probably deferring to whatever the minimum age at the state level was uh, for suffrage at that time. So let's see, next one down, were, were age minimums for women in addition, oh, it's the same question. Okay, and then Matthew Sanford, curious about what I think led City Johnston Katz to make a statement like that. Do you think it had to do with the involvement of women in the prohibition movement? I personally have not read enough of his records to, to, to have a really good understanding of it, but I think you bring up a great point there that what got Sidney Johnston Katz into the governor's office is the fact that he was championing prohibition and that he represented an alternative to the Democratic Party at a time when Democrats were very divided over the question of prohibition and a few other things as well. And women were most certainly a big part of the constituency uh, having to do with pro the prohibition movement. The Women's Christian Temperance Union and a number of anti-saloon leagues all across the state were, even though they couldn't vote, these women were strongly lobbying for more and more legislation to curb the manufacture, sale, and consumption of alcohol throughout the state of Florida. And it doesn't take much imagination to think that those women would have been right in line behind him. Uh, if he had wanted to run for office down the road, if they were able to vote. So I think you're onto something there. Oh, and did he face political backlash for his stance? And did it help him when the 19th Amendment was ratified with women voters? Katz was already not very popular with Democrats, which were the ascendant political party at that time, with this one very rare exception. Uh, they already were very mad at him for, for splitting the vote. So it's kind of hard to hear very much criticism of that decision in and amongst all the other things that they didn't like, such as the fact that he put members of his family in his cabinet and a few other things like that. But I think that you're onto something there as well, uh, that that would have given Democrats a bludgeoning device um, to use against him. Because as you can see from Frank Clark's statements, uh, that that uh, w white Democrats really saw this as opening a, a Pandora's box that could not be shut again and might very well invite uh, federal intrusion into something that they saw as being strictly a states' rights issue. Oh, we've got some more questions. Let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, okay. So I think we're caught up with questions. Any more? And again, I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to take questions by email. Uh, if you think of something later on down the line, if you're just you know, lying awake in bed tonight, staring at the ceiling and you're thinking, wait a minute, what about? I'm glad to take that question too. Uh, so, uh, so we look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you so much, Josh. All right, it's my pleasure. I'll copy and paste your email address back in the chat just in case anybody missed it. All right. All right. As always, you were wonderful. Thank you for joining right. us tonight. 
It's my pleasure. I hope everybody has a great, safe weekend. Stay safe out there. And uh, yes, when we're back open, please come see us at the State Archives. It's your State Archives as much as anybody else's. And we would be very glad to serve you and help you with research projects, uh, either for school or for your next project or just for fun. So please do come and see us. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for your continued support. Uh, we will see you next week on September 24th. 24th um, at 6 p.m. again, uh, but this time we will be seeing you on a new platform. Uh, we will be using GoToWebinar for this one, um, and we will have Dr. Sarah Brown from Tallahassee Community College. She'll be discussing um, the African Drum and Dance Ensemble, the heritage of Western African dance, and why it is important to our community. So thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe and be well. Thank you so much, Josh. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.